Hi. Welcome to today's episode of Extreme Narcissism TV, the Inebriation Nation. This is my this is one of my one man assembly line scams. Uh this particular one, it was I wanted to make trolls out of clay. I made my own kind of troll. And then eventually I was gonna get around to molding them, but first I just wanted to just you know make a bunch and sell a bunch and see how it went. I sold every one I ever made, but I never went into the manufacturer. I was like, who needs a troll? I started to get um, philosophical about art and in my pinings and musings and all that stuff, I had determined that nobody needed a troll. Nobody needed one of these. But people liked them and I sold them. And uh, I got a little bit more of them because they were all handmade. But I did plan on, like, I wanted to make them out of paper pulp because they'd be really lightweight. And then basically what they were is, you'll see the process as I go through the video. They were just, like, sculpted in clay, whatever color. I think it was white clay. And then painted in a brown wash. Like, covered the whole thing brown. Like, just paint it brown. All, every single last one of them. And then put over colors over top. So I was just, I was just like, coloring the whole, the whole, you'll see, there's pictures of it in here. Um, I, I would co cover the whole thing in, in brown paint. And then dry brush over top whatever color I wanted there. And then add the cheeks and the nose blush and all that stuff. But anyway, I got a lot of these pictures. And a lot of these trolls. And this is me taking pictures of them to sell them. But, I mean, really they're going to be on somebody's shelf or in their desk or whatever. <laughs> but, yeah, this is like a little display I had set up of ones I made. I mean, I, uh, maybe a couple of them I gave away to people. But for the most part, it's just me. I just didn't want to work for somebody else. I was like, I could sell these. And I got to the point where I could just churn them out, which is the point. I'd churn them out. I, I would treat it like a day job. Like, here's, I put my hours in. Here's my results. Okay, whenever stuff's ready to sell, sell it. And then, like, whatever way I wanted to come at selling it. It was like a vendor fair thing, a little place. I never wanted to spend money on a booth, but sometimes I did. And it paid off. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. Um, I never really gambled on that kind of stuff. Online, there's Etsy. There's eBay. Uh, you know, and then just, just getting stuff into shows or local galleries, or whatever. Like, hey, you want my little bric-a-brac things? Oh, cool, yeah, you made these? Definitely. You'll see pictures of that, too, probably. If not in this video, in another one. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a different take on it. You can see all the ones in the background. Eventually, some of these will get hair and stuff. You'll see later. Well, you saw already. But there's a lot of these pictures, so... Yeah, there's a close-up of one. I gave that one to somebody. This one's never sold. I know who owns it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sold, sold. Um, the skeleton one that was pretty popular, and it was that would it was just not even very good. See, I just started putting hair, like just scraps of anything to not spend any money. How big were these things? I would say they were about um, I don't know, like four inches, five inches. I don't know, between four and six inches. But I, I did have it kind of down to. If you can see, they're all kind of the. They're all different because they're one of a kind. I didn't want to get bored making them. But they're all kind of the same, too. Yeah, there's this, this skeleton one that went over really good. It was easy to make that one, too. It's just like I would I would make the form out of clay. I'd press it on the foil. I was using a Sculpey clay. So I'd press the form. i just press clay around the Sculpey, ball, ball, a ball of tin foil underneath here, a ball of tin foil. Put the clay on top just to economize on clay. But it has to be solid. You can't give somebody a thing that's going to crack when they pick it up. You have to be able to like, drop it and stuff. That's my policy. But, I mean, if you drop my stuff, you're going to mess it up. But I was surprised how durable my stuff is because I make it that way. You know what I mean? Even though it doesn't weigh a lot, which is great if you're going to mail stuff. If you're making stuff and you're going to sell stuff and sell it in the mail, my thought was make it lightweight. So if I ever go into production of useless bric-a-brac, which I don't intend to, it's got to be made out of paper pulp or something lightweight and cheap that people consider garbage that I could use to make cool stuff. And then the, the shipping of it would be like super easy. But also has to be durable. So it'd have to be some kind of plastic, plasticization or plastinization or whatever. Some kind of epoxy or resin that I could add to the paper pulp to sort of plasticize the paper. <clears throat> there was an artist that had a really great uh, uh, a technique where she made big sculptures and she just got egg crate and pulp because it was already like Egg crate and uh, egg cartons. They're made of paper, some of them. Not the styrofoam ones, the paper ones. We put them in water and they just fall apart. So she would just have everybody she knew giving her this stuff. And she got so much of it, right? 
everybody uses eggs all the time, so she just would always take it and use it, and use it for sculptures, and I guess she found sources. Artists want to make stuff, find sources for place. I knew an artist that he made stuff out of, um, yeah, see, I just, like, cheap arts and craft stores. There was, like, a whole bunch of these, like, ten for a dollar. I was like, okay, I'll try them out. Didn't really go over so well, but I, I would just try anything out that didn't cost much, much that could add flair. In terms of sculpture, I didn't want to have eyes that I had to paint. That's why most of them all have their eye. well, all of them have, like, their eyes closed like this. That was going to be a design I was going to go for that gave a sort of sense of realism. It's a kind of thing that was, uh, was this thing that, you know that the Japanese have figured out, like, cute. Like, they get the formula of that, but not just them. Robert Crumb, the artist, the famous per pervert artist, who does re draw really cute cartoon animals, uh, he said he, he acquired the curse of cuteness. He worked for the American Greeting Card Company, and and under their employ in the 60s, I guess it was, he was just drawing shitty, uh, you know, like, cartoony gre greeting cards. Make it cuter, make it cuter. So I guess he learned some tricks on how to make things cute, which he said he learned there. And I learned a bunch of that stuff on my own, too, just by observing things, like what do people like, and what, what appeals to things, and things that look like babies appeal. But these are gr little grotesqueries, little gross men, and the reason that they look gross, and I went that route, is because I can sculpt them with imperfections, and that handmade quality works. You know, how do I put it? The handmade quality comes through, and I can be a little bit sloppy and assembly line them quick, but it still looks good. You know, I just have to make the things that need to look good look good, and everything else is negligible. You know, and I would, I know, and this is, I'm not selling these anymore, so this isn't a commercial, but I would buy one of these things. If I saw somebody selling one that was cheap enough, you know, like, oh, I'll get one of those, you know, and I would keep it. I would put it on a shelf. Not anymore, but, you know, at the time when I made stuff like this, it's so embarrassing to show old art, too, because most of what I sh I've found files of, Whenever I find files, I'm just going to throw it up. But most of what I found is hack work stuff. So, you know, just me getting by. So it's not like personal or how I feel about things or life. It was just me like trying on different, you know. I mean, of course there's some fun for me in all this. A lot, actually. Because I could just do this instead of going to, you know, work in an office or work in a factory or wherever, you know, work in front of a monitor, right? I had a job in animation when animation wasn't fun to be working in anymore. I mean, I used to hear the crazy stories about people working at, like, bullshit places like Ruby Spears or, um, you know, any one of those, like, Deke Studios and all that stuff like that over in California and these different places. And it was just, like, party time and fun because the cartoons were shit. And they just threw money at toy lines and made cartoons. But when I got... I had a, a friend who was really just fantastic in that he got me the job, he got me, I knew nothing about computer animation or animation and he got me a job because I could draw because I had studied like to animate and I could animate so he got me the job there but by the time I got there it was all computers so my job was sitting in front of a monitor all day and I didn't like the people I worked with so I was like this career is over so I thought okay I'll just pitch shows and stuff like that so then I just thought well I'll just be a creator and, and get in that way and uh, I got attention. I did, like pretty quick, because I understood cute. They hated my story ideas because they didn't sell anything. They were just, I, I was trying to be moral and preach things I thought. And they're like, no, we just want to sell toys to boys. And um, yeah. So anyway, this there's a lot of these. I didn't even get to this stuff. I'm just going to plow through these because beyond that, yeah, that one was a particularly, like that one I want to cast in like, you know, like cast in paper, pulp, or plaster or something. Not plaster, too heavy. But, yep, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them on the shelf that I, you know, I was like had them all lined up to sell. My little, pretty little maids all in a row. Oh, over, I can't see it. It's coming up though, other photos. Um, yeah, just more of the same. Oh, there's other stuff I made. These are other sculptures, like little maquettes for different things. And I had a bunch of them all and I put them together. That that's a neat one. This is the butthole. Before that, South Park had the butthole face thing. Well, actually, it was a cartoon in the '70s. Everybody's drawn an asshole face thing. But before, before South Park, just to say that it wasn't inspired by them, I did do this little butthole guy, and he's pooping out turds, and it's like a cute little cartoon. I made T-shirts of it. 
I actually have one. I'll do another video of, of like remnants of stuff I made that I still have around that I sold. I made a this asshole man t-shirt and people bought them. And then here's just like little maquette things and and stuff and then yeah, this doesn't look good, but it, I assure you it's a cat man. His t he's got a tail on the back there, but people said, what's this supposed to be? And I'm like, no, it's not some kind of minstrel thing. Uh, this still exists somewhere. I've seen that recently. Somebody I know has that. I can't remember who though. Uh, and all the other stuff, it's all sold. Oh, this was a gift to somebody. It was it was their kid as Spider-Man because they like Spider-Man. So I did a little Super D squashed version of them. Again, these are full color. Oh, yeah, that was, um, I don't know, it's supposed to be a chipmunk or something. And they, they were going to put clothes on top, and I didn't even have anything to do with that, the felting of the clothes. And then they didn't pay me, so I sold it on my own. I had no non-disclosure, so I was like, hey, you didn't make me sign anything, so whatever. These are my cats for my little cactus thing. Um, oh, this is my, here you go. This is how I worked. I would have my little CD with tape deck, because that still mattered at the time. I, still, I was still transitioning from tapes to, you know, CDs, and I had some files of music. But here we go. You can see sculptures. There was something a friend of mine made. <laughs> Obviously, it's not me. But this, I would, I would, they would sculpt it in, they would be sculpted brown. I mean, they would be sculpted in white clay and painted brown. And then on top, I would lay the color and just dry brush over color. Like I said before. But you get the idea. And anyway, yeah, a bunch of those pictures is kind of boring. <clears throat> There's some scale. There's one in my hand. Bad quality photos, sorry about that. I'll try and get through them. All right, there's me painting them. Again, the cheapest, shittiest paints I could find. But I wanted things to last. I wanted things to be durable. So I'd find good plastic aerosol spray. And a lot of the stuff I have, I've had for years because, like, they would just clearance that stuff. And it just, it's, it lasts forever. It's plastic in a thing. As long as it doesn't solidify. So I would plasticize this stuff after I painted it with these, like, 50 cents a bottle at the time when I bought them. It's probably still the same. 50 cents a bottle craft paints. These like just pigments in a plastic and pigment. And I would use that to just dry brush over top. I take a, a brush and just go just dry brush until I had it to the level I wanted. Yellow where the yellow is. Different size brushes. And then when I was done with all the skin tone uh, then I put the you know, wash of red over for the cheeks, the nose and all that stuff and, and bring it out however I wanted. And, you know, there you go, you see them different stages of production. There's the clay. It's the Sculpey stuff. I, I had a really, again, a, a, a teacher mentor type that was an artist. Uh, she got me a deal on like a shitload of clay and I was like, I will give, here's 250 bucks, get me Sculpey. She's had access. So that helped me be a, an assembly line. You have to be opportunistic, especially in this day and age. Like, man, I remember in college, these kids would always throw out mat board and stuff. That's great material for painting on, for watercolors, for making art you can sell, for just cutting it down and making your own mats, for taking some, some kid who doesn't care about arts anyway, his crooked mat, and you take, you can just straighten it out and use it. I used to do stuff like that all the time. It was just as much fun as dumpster diving. The janitors didn't care because they knew kids did it every semester. Like, yeah, just take it out of here. Take all these paintings away. I even made money. Oh, I should have said this before. Uh, I, I'm going to have to say this in another episode about painting. But I used to take student paintings, because you know how like hipsters and that type and outsider art and lowbrow art, I would take other people's student paintings and tweak them and fuck with them and put like occult stuff in or a third eye or take somebody's portrait of themselves and make them puking out of their mouth. But like try and keep it in their bad art school style and sell them. I, I'm, I have no access to colleges, no desire to like travel to them and go through dumpsters. I'm not, I'm, I don't do that. I don't need to. But um, it was fun to find free art. I don't... Hey, so if you hear this, art school kids, or what, you know, don't be a creep and go to school. There's too many rules against that shit now. See, here's different stages of production. But yeah, go get those at the end of the semester. They throw out the, they throw the stuff and they, the, all the kids throw the shit away that they don't like or don't take home. Take it all. Paint over it. Even if you don't think you might not want it, there may come a time when like, I want to work bigger, I want to work smaller, or I'll use this piece or whatever. Just take it because it will give you a resource in whatever like shit place you live in, shitty rent, apartment, a room, a garage, I don't know where you live. Artists usually are willing to forego stuff to be able to have time because art is a solitary thing. 
you know, for the most part. I could paint in front of other artists. I did like to do that. You know, not plein air. I never really did that. Like, paint outside with another artist. But I would paint, like, you know, like in, in a classroom, like, just like a group of people. Like, yeah, let's just all paint. Just free paint whatever you want. And unfortunately, I would be subjected to NPR. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> but it was NPR the jazz time, not NPR the news stuff. But they always come up with their updates and the, the guy that comes in with the drone and says, you know, something terrible and then leaves and then back to the music. Just like Patton Oswalt said. It's just more of the same. I'm just showing you the stuff I made. Yeah, just little scraps of hair, little pieces of, um, like, uh, felt or fabric. Like stuffed animals, like people would throw stuff. I'm like, oh, I'll take that. It was like eyeballs from a stuffed animal I could use for art piece. I would just... Any kind of garbage that people would have, like, like people, like some, like you know, friends throwing out kids' toys or whatever. I'm like, hey, can I have that? And I just pull the eyes out of the toy horse or like a doll that had realistic eyes. I just pop the eyes out of the head and use them, and then put them into a sculpture. Uh, you know, or whatever. You're gonna see other sculptures I do in other videos where I would just like any. I was. Just, you have to be opportunistic if you're an artist. You have to like. Can I use this? Can I use that? Can I use this? Just to get by, maybe, unless it's not your thing. If you're not going to make art out of junk and you don't want to do that, just focus on your thing. You're like, no, I just, I do, I do paper. I'm in front of paper. I don't need all that shit you're talking about. But this is sculpture. I'm talking about hacking it. This is a video about hacking it. This is a video about getting by. So, this is me doing that. Again, just taking way too many pictures of the same shit. But once I had a design, I would do like the same, I would do the same thing again. You know what I mean? Like, I would do the same ones again, like popular ones. Like, you can see these two are similar. They're not the same. One's, this one's standing. No, they're both sitting. But anyway, I had certain designs I would use over again. And then, again, you can see examples. I had very few colors. You can tell. Look, there's the colors I had. I just bought a pack of these for probably a buck, right? Four for a buck, a little pack. I mean, it was a little six pack of the cheapest paints from art, st art warehouse store bullshit. Yellow ochre. It's kind of, I kind of like Rembrandt's palette, so I'd kind of find my own variants of it. This is some kind of white or yellow, but that was just me having a Rembrandt thing. And one, you see it reflected in everything I do. I like his palette. I mean, like, I like the zen of it. Uh, I don't like zen, but I'll use the term. But I like the zen of the idea of simplicity reveals the master. Pick a couple colors and do everything with them. Rembrandt was amazing. The three color magazine printing process was amazing for pulp, for throwaway stuff. So, that was just more sculptures, like little demony things I made out of clay to see if I could sell. I know they have holes here because I would, the doll eyes that I would take from garbage or thrift stores, wherever I could find cool ones that I would have to pay nothing for. Like I would go to a thrift store and get a grab bag of stuffed animals or stuff, or a grab bag of dolls or whatever for 99 cents. And then just pop all the eyes out, and th you know, throw the throw everything else I couldn't use away, and then put them in things like this. So this is unpainted clay, hollow, in the back, hollow, no, hollow in the back, so I can put the eyeballs in. Uh, I don't think I have any in this slideshow of what it looks like with the eyeballs in. And then these teeth were cooked grains of rice that I would put in when I cooked the clay, and then just let them bake. That's why they turn brown. And then, but they're in there, you know, like they're fastened in and I put glue in and I paint the whole thing. I do a lot of washes, dry brushing, and antiquing to give detail. Oh, this one, this, uh, eventually I sold this. This was a prototype. I was going to make a, a shit squeak toy that looked like a children's squeak toy. It was going to be uh, crap. But not because I'm some kind of fecal freak or obsessed with that kind of stuff. Because something I I'm not going to put on YouTube because I'm afraid it'll get booted. I used to do these poo paintings, I called them. Not that I painted with shit. But I do these paintings of cartoon turds and cartoon kids eating cartoon turds. And they're smiling and laughing and flies are buzzing around their face. And they're funny and juvenile. And I did them out of anger. I was some, I said to some, I was having, I was talking to a friend and I was like, what do you want me to paint? Like, what do people want? Like, they want me to paint like cartoons of kids eating turds? Is that what people want? And everybody laughed and they thought it was funny. And I was like, they kind of did. Like, in a weird way. So I did one, like, fuck you, to my friend. <laughs> and they liked it. And then other people saw it and did more. So then it became, whenever I needed money, I wound up doing, like, a lot of them. Like, maybe even a hundred of these weird poo and kids eating turds and acting like it's great. And, like, all these different themes of, like, anthropomorphized doo-doo and stuff like that. 
because I saw that on South Park people liked the talking shit and I think that was part of what happened how the whole thing came about I was like oh is that what I should do p p paintings of kid because uh, yeah, I think that's how it happened there's South Park and somebody said about that and I was like you like that I said those kids are playing with a turd and it's a show that's supposed to be for grown-ups but it's all kids do all these things and you're letting your kids watch it and blah 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 and I was you know yelling at them <laughs> and, and, and I said what do you want me to paint like paintings of, of talking turds I said I, maybe I should just paint paintings of ki cartoon kids eating shit so I did but I don't know how to show them on YouTube. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I came to the end of the slideshow. But yeah, I think I'm going to end this video too. But yeah, so then one of my ideas was once I just... So anyway, I would do these paintings whenever I need money. And I'd throw it up usually on eBay because it was the quickest, easiest way not to wait. I'd put an auction price or a buy it now price on. And I would call them my $32 paintings. Because I would, you know, cost of materials was nothing. I'd get like a 3 or $4... Um, 18 by 24 canvas, use the coupon for the store. I, I would have all the paints and supplies already. I'd get not, not the same stuff I showed you in this video. I would just use cheap student acrylics that would come in like $5 tubes. And I would use those. And then I painted these paintings. I even had somebody help me do them. The, somebody that wasn't necessarily an artist, but they would paint the backgrounds. I'd say, just paint them in these different colors. So I'd have a bunch of different, and I would just let them assembly line the backgrounds. And not not the actual background, just the color of the background, so that I could just drop in the character, or the poo, or the kid, whatever, just lay it on top of the colored background that somebody else had painted for me, and then they would get something for you know they got they got I gave them money for doing that for me, and it was fun to have somebody to hang out with, and I would paint them the whole while, and, and you know they'd say, "Wow, you do it really fast," and I'm like, "That's the whole point." And then those I would call, well, I I. I would call it my $10 an hour job because I could do at least one in an hour, like a full finished one, 8 by 10 and then like an 18 by 24 not a poop painting, but like a, a portrait or a monster art or whatever bullshit I did and, you know, that's not in this video. I would just, um, 18 by 24 take me two and a half, three hours doing one of those and I would call those my $32 paintings because at the least, I was like, at minimum, I have to get 32 bucks for this for me to make it worth it. You know, which was just really something I made up in my head. If I look back on it, I'm like, I don't really why I came. I guess because of shipping the whole thing. But shipping was a separate cost. Because whatever somebody bought for something, it still has to be shipped. And you have to incur for what stuff's going to cost to ship. So shipping was cheaper then. So I didn't mind. You know, it was cheap to mail this. It was cheap to mail this, like, clay with uh, uh, solid tin foil inside. Um, and again, I would have tin foil. I never used like f used tin foil. I would have to buy tin foil, but it was cheap enough to get. And um, yeah, I probably killed myself with all the tin foil I had on my hands. Right? I remember I had a teacher that I, I learned I could sculpt good carving. So uh, I wanted these to have a carved look. But the reason I mentioned carving is because I, I I discovered I loved carving plaster. You could just take a milk carton and. <laughs> You just take a milk carton and fill it with plaster, and I would chisel it into whatever I wanted. And it was really cool. I just loved the doing of it. And then my teacher said to me, she said, hey, we both smoke. You know, me and her both smoke. And uh, I ruined my lungs with plaster, and it's something that happens to sculptures. She was a master sculptress. And she said, something happened to sculptures. So think about that before you decide to fall in love with plaster, which I already had, and she knew it. She saw it. Cause that's what good teachers notice these things. They watch their students because, you know, they're not just trying to get their next job or whatever. They pay attention. That's how you find a good teacher in college. But anyway, um, she I never did it again after she said that because I saw how she had trouble breathing and she smoked. And I was like, I believed her because I can remember thinking, like, man, like, why do I feel funny, like heavy? And she's like, you have wet plaster and inside you, you breathe it in. Because I wasn't even wearing, like, a, a respirator. And even when I would wear like one of those face mask respirators when I take it off I'd still have plaster underneath my uh, underneath my underneath the mask like it would get in like I'd breathe it through anyway the particles are so small um, now I guess I could say another job I had I had a job carving store displays in malls they carve them out of styrofoam so I worked in a big warehouse that made like the Easter Bunny's house and Santa Claus's place and you know there's a crew that built the shit out of wood but it all had to be made to, sh to be shipped all over the world like the guy who owned the place uh, 
was I think well he had a, he had a British accent so he was from like England I don't know what part anymore I don't remember but he's a really nice guy but he did that like he had like the job like there's not many people if you think about it in the country that are gonna make this the Christmas thing for Santa Claus to be at or the thing for the Easter Bunny to be at but anyway I worked for one of those places and uh, like it was toxic. So I didn't, I didn't work there long. Even though I liked the people, I liked the place, and I loved the boss. It was a fantastic, but it was toxic. And we got paid good too. But every, but we were carving styrofoam, like because it's lightweight, and it's easy to carve. But you're using like these hot tools. So like not only you're carving styro, styrofoam, but you're like using hot knives to melt the foam, and it has this toxic smell. So. All, it's like a job where all day long like you're wearing a respirator, but everybody I worked with was like like fuck it like so but there's like How do I describe this? At the end of the day like no matter what you did to take precautions like you would just get it in you would be in your clothes You come home take your clothes off you'd have styrofoam in you not like styrofoam balls like like small particles and I thought oh man this is like the you know this is like the plaster I'm breathing the plastic. This is plastic stuff. This is really toxic. I'm breathing this garbage in like every, like every day. Every time I come in work, every time they call me, hey, can you can you come in and do this? And can you come? In? I'm like, yeah, sure. And um, and I would do it, but it was so toxic, and I had to wear a respirator when I'm cutting with the hot knife with the plastic. Um, I mean, cutting the styrofoam with the hot knife. Anyway, I made like the Easter Bunny's roof tiles and sections of a wall and like a dog and a, a, a styrofoam dog for a pet shop and this is the beginning of the builder bears things inside the malls so i remember that coming in like i i don't think i worked on a builder bear thing but i know that the other well, the other guy did cuz i remember that stuff being in there i'm like what's this and they're like oh it's this really cool thing where like kids can come in and make their own uh, stuffed bear so there's like a whole bunch of these going you know like all over the place and i was like wow cool I thought then, I mean, now I don't know what I think of it. It's just like, you just like, it's like a ice cream dispenser for kids. Like, you just take your stuffed animal dead body and go, and fill it up with foam. <laughs> fill it up with plastic. But I was getting filled up with plastic and it was unavoidable. And everybody that, everybody, like me and everybody, we all had skin that looked red like sausage casing. Because no matter what you did, it was affecting your skin. So it turned our skin red like a, uh, I don't know what you'd say, like a ring bologna or something, like a like a red sausage, which was like horribly bad. So, yeah. But I heard bad stories. There was a girl I dated that worked in in movies and stuff, and I guess she was in boss in charge of bossing people around in commercial sets and then building the sets and stuff. And she got really sick because she was always at work around toxic materials, and she went through hell to, uh, you know. Because of toxic chemicals, so I made, so I learned pretty quick, you know. Okay, no, no, don't be around poisonous stuff. Because I saw the effects that it had, and I had, like I said, I had a teacher outright say to me, "It was like, don't do it." She's like, I, I killed my lungs with it. She probably saw that gleam in my eye that she had. That was like, oh no, he likes it. Stop him. He's gonna die. <laughs> but I'm good. I don't have any breathing problems. Um, I just have problems not drinking when I'm. You know, not taking enough, like not having a thing of water when I'm talking here. I don't mean alcohol, I just mean like to stay hydrated. So anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. So if you're still here listening to me talk through the same slideshow, the same, same like eight different trolls you saw over and over again, uh, thanks, I appreciate it. But I think that'll be episode, so bye.